So today, today we are tackling, uh, it's an older movie. Uh, anybody ever see The Greatest Story Ever Told? Yeah, okay, most folks have. Uh, it is a three hour and 19 minute, and the team, the group that was here on Friday evening can vouch for it. It took every bit of three hours and 19 minutes. Uh, it's actually, uh, for its time especially, it was really a powerful, powerful movement or, or movie, and it incorporated some of the greatest actors of that generation. So it, it's, and uh, you know, I, I know that I'm making fun of it, kind of, but by the same token, it's worth the time. You know, it really is, because it tells the story that uh, covers the birth, ministry, death, resurrection of Jesus, and more. But here's at the movies. Oop, went one too many. The greatest story ever told is a magnificent picture. Stunningly rendered for the screen. A monumental film. It may run for 40 years. The greatest story ever told could be the most majestic production the screen will ever have. One of the greatest motion pictures yet made. Pictorially magnificent. A classic, timeless picture. I send my messenger who shall prepare the way. Listen to the voice of one crying in the wilderness. One whose sandals I am worthy to carry. Who are you? Baptize me, John. What is your name, my friend? James. Little James. They call me Little because I'm the youngest. What is your name? Jesus. That's a good name. Thank you. You have judged her rightly. She is guilty of adultery. The law calls for her to be stoned. Yes. Let him among you who is without sin cast the first stone. <laughs> Nazareth. Is, uh, it tells the story throughout his ministry of Christ, and it's you know it's a it, it's a movie, so it takes a little bit of dramatic license, but it actually does a pretty good job of relating the story. Um, you know, I, I like to watch uh, this this um, show. It's called Discovery Un or Expedition Unknown. It's on Discovery Channel, and it's a show about pursuing legends and stories from the past. And they did one on Jesus. They did one on uh, not just Jesus, but that time and, 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 and more. And it's really interesting in, in that it focuses primarily, in fact, they look at archaeology and documentation. What is the evidence? So as you might expect, uh, there's some, cha you know, some challenging thoughts that come into that. One is, and, and in it, who's been to the Holy Land? Uh, just, just a few. Or, um, how many tombs are there? Huh? How many tombs for Jesus? Is, yeah. So there's at least two. Yeah, and they pointed that out, and they said, well, they think that he was buried here. They think that he was buried here. They, there's discrepancies, and, and this show kind of tackles some of those things. Uh, one of the things that, that came out was they think there's two Bethlehems. Um, and I say Bethlehem because the Hebrew for Bethlehem is two words. It's Bet, which means town. And lechem, which means bread. When I do communion, you hamoti lechem min ha'aretz, which is that who gives us the bread from the earth. Uh, and it's kind of, we just sang about Ebenezer, right? Did you know that Ebenezer as well is two words? It's eben, which is stone, and ezer, which is help. So it's the stone of help that we talk about when we talk about the Ebenezer. 
So when, we, so when we sing that line in Come Thou Fount, we're rem- actually hearkening back to Samuel in uh, 1 Samuel 7, 12, when he set up an Ebenezer uh, to commemorate God's help in giving the Israelites a victory over the Philistines. Um, I, I, I love that, you know, obviously, I, this, I love this kind of stuff, you know, because it's like, it gets you, gets you to kind of look deeper. Um, but back to Discovery Unknown. They made the claim through an academic in, in Israel that the only actual references to Jesus historically are the New Testament writings, and the Gospels are are certainly the primary force, but they've claimed that there is no extra-biblical or outside-the-Bible support for, or evidence for, for, for Jesus. Now, I don't think that's true, and so I'm going to argue again. If I was, if I was on there, I'm going to have to call Josh Gates and say, hey, I want to argue, you know, because we do have some. Josephus, who was a Jewish historian, wrote in the late century, and he wrote this. He said, at this time, there was a wise man who was called Jesus. His conduct was good. He was known to be virtuous. Many people came from, from, to be his disciples. Pilate condemned him. So it, it reflects the story that's found in the Gospels. Now, those who are kind of anti-Jesus scholars dispute that that's actually Josephus. They make the claim that Christians came in later and adjusted Josephus's writings. But... There's more. Well, it's Paul Harvey. Uh, and for the rest of the story, there was a, a Roman senator and historian named Tacitus, and he said this, he called, it, and this is in the annals, it's circa 116, so it's a you know, good couple of generations after Christ, but still, he said, called Christians by the populace Christus, Jesus, from whom in the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our pure procurator, procurators, Pontius Pilate. And that one is not under dispute that, the, that it's genuine, but Tacitus never gave his source. And obviously he didn't know Jesus. He wasn't alive at that time. So that opens the door for those who are going to dispute to say, well, his source was probably bad. And I suppose we will always see disputes about Jesus, about who he was, about who he wasn't. The early church, if you can imagine the early church, man, trying to fig- try and figure this out. So Jesus came and he did all these miracles and he did all of these things and now he's gone. He's not here anymore. And you're trying to figure out who is this Jesus? Who is he? And because of, of trying to figure it out, we ended up with a lot of different groups and there's more than what I put up here on the, on, the, on the screen. There were those who thought that he was fully God, but not human. They were called the Marcionites. They followed Marcion. Uh, the Gnostics thought that Jesus was a man separate from the God, Christ. Um, Jesus Christ was a good Jewish man who, was, who wasn't divine at birth, but God used him to sacrifice himself for our sins because he was unusually righteous. That's the Ebionites. And on and on, the Montanists, the Thomasites, the Ascetics, the Manichaeists, and many more. They were trying to figure out who Jesus was. It's a challenge. No, there was no one like Jesus before Jesus. There's been no one like Jesus since Jesus. So who was he? And that's why, and we're going to close with singing about the creed. But that's where they became so important. The first was the Apostles' Creed. And this wasn't written down by the apostles themselves, but it came from their teachings. And this was being circulated in the church prior to any of the councils that met. And it's, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and buried, descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, says Catholic, means universal the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. We, we use that Apostles' Creed in many of the liturgies that we do for baptism and other membership and those things. And that came before the councils. The councils, early 300s, they're still trying to figure this out. It, 
it was God, was Jesus divine? Was he human? Who is he? And so the Emperor Constantinople called uh, together the Christian bishops to try to resolve that in 325. And the Creed of Nicaea came out of that meeting. And it was finalized in another meeting in 381. And it, it's very similar. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and of all that is seen and unseen. It's the triune God. That's Father. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, one in being with the Father. Through him all things were made, a reference to John. For us men in our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, suffered death, was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures, ascended into heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. The second part of the Trinity. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic, meaning universal, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Just one more happened along the way, and then I'll, I'll get back to the story. See, there were continuing divisions that happened, and so there was another council that was called at a meeting at Chalcedon, which is close to Constantinople, which is where the, that other council was held, but it's also important, the Chalcedonian Creed. And it reads a little bit different, but it just verifies kind of for, for us in the church. See, it's simpler for us because we have these. So we have who Christ is and, and who the Father is and who the Spirit is, but they had a lot of work to do back then. And it gets, the Chalcedonian Creed says, We then, following the Holy Fathers, all with one consent, teach men to confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man. You see that this is, this is kind of just going, this is it. This is who he is. Of a reasonable, rational soul and body, consubstantial, coessential with the Father according to the Godhead and consubstantial with us, fully human, fully divine, according to the manhood. In all things like unto us without sin, begotten before all ages of the Father according to the Godhead and in these latter days for us and for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, the mother of God, according to the manhood, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures, inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably, the distinction of natures being by no means taken away by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved and concurring in one person, and one subsistence, not parted or divided into two persons, but one in the same Son, and only begotten God, the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the prophets from the beginning have declared concerning him. And the Lord Jesus Christ himself has taught us, and the creed of the Holy Fathers has handed down to us. It's a lot of words, but it definitively for the church said Jesus Christ was fully human, fully divine. He was God, and he was human. He, knew, he knows what we go through, and he is with and from the Father. So let's get back to the movie, which largely follows Scripture with some license taken, as movies tend to do. John the Baptist had told people about Jesus, and he saw Charlton Heston, you know, Moses and John the Baptist. He was in the river, saying, a voice crying in the wilderness. He had told the people there was this amazing, incredible person coming. And to all the people who had been just, you know, blown away by John, traveled to the wilderness to see him and hear him preach, John had said that there was one coming that he was not worthy to latch the sandals of. And John told the people to prepare, repent, 
Turn from your wicked ways. Be prepared. Someone more powerful than me is coming. I can only baptize you with water, but he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. It's going to be beyond anything that you can imagine. And then Jesus came and was baptized by John. You saw that scene. And then shortly after, John is arrested, and he's locked away and eventually beheaded. When he was arrested, it, it was kind of a transition. It was the transition from John, the voice crying in the wilderness, to Jesus' ministry uh, becoming more active. It began to be, the time is fulfilled, is what Jesus said in response to John's arrest. And Jesus' message was not that radically different from John's. He still said, repent, turn from, turn from sin, come back to the Father, turn from sin. And his, and, and his ministry began. I don't know if you've ever really thought about how this all came into being, but can you imagine being the four fishermen? Um, what is it, Andrew? I wrote it down. I'm trying to remember. Peter, Peter, John. <laughs> somebody, somebody help me. Who are the four fishermen? Do you know off the top of your head? James, James, John, Simon, Andrew, John, and James. We did pretty good. I forgot Peter. How could you forget Peter? Um, he probably dove out of the boat and swam to the shore when he was gone. But so they're fishing, right? And this guy, who they don't know, comes along. And back then, fishermen were, it was a good living. You know, this was on the Sea of Galilee. They, they were, you know, met, probably making good money. They had families. They had all of these things. And Jesus shows up, somebody that they didn't know. They may have heard about him. And he says, come and follow me. And what do they do? Why? Is in that, it's kind of, I'm going to leave my, think about this. Those of you who are in a career or those of you who have retired and had a career, whatever, think about it. Jesus comes to you and says, come on. And you have to leave everything and go. It's, it's hard to fathom. There was, you know, obviously something really special about Jesus for them to do that. But they did. They got out. They left their homes. They dropped everything. They said yes to that command, really, because he didn't really ask them. He said, come and follow me. And I think he spoke with authority. He wasn't hesitant. He knew who he was. He knew where he was going. And, and when he said, said come, it wasn't like, hey, y'all, if you've got time, you know, if you're not too busy, would you come and follow me? It wasn't that. It was, come and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And they did. Jesus spoke with an authority, I think, that is hard to fathom sometimes. They had no choice but to follow. Some of us have experienced that. Some of us in our faith journey have gone Okay, this doesn't make any sense, but I'm going to do it anyway. They sacrificed family, friends, home, careers for the sake of following a man that they didn't know yet. And it does bring to bear the question, how much are we willing to sacrifice in order to respond to Christ's call upon our lives? An hour a week, a few dollars in the collection plate, and that's all good stuff. I'm not knocking it. We do that today. But what are we willing to do tomorrow? What are we willing to do next week? What are we willing to do next month? What if Jesus, like he did to them, says, I got something for you. And in your heart, you know he's right. And you know what it is. What if it's Thursday at 10 and he puts in your head the thought of someone that you haven't thought of in years and you know that you're supposed to call him, but you haven't talked to him in years? Does Jesus amaze us enough that we're still willing to give of ourselves for him? It's a question for the week. I'll let you weigh that. 
Jesus arrived at the synagogue in Capernaum and he began to teach and the people around him were astonished at his teaching because his teaching was different. It wasn't anything like anything they'd heard before. It had an authority to it, I'm sure. He didn't argue with people. He didn't try to convince them. He didn't try and cajole them. No, you need to understand. He just said, this is what it says. This is what it means. And, and he didn't put guilt trips. He didn't depend on the authority of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, obviously, or teachers to back him up. None of that was for Jesus. He simply spoke. He didn't lecture at people. He didn't enter into debate with people. He proclaimed the word of God as if the nerve of him, his words alone were sufficient. Sharing his story was efficient, sufficient. That, that witnessing what he knew, right? What does a witness do? Shares what they have seen, heard, and experienced of God. And when we're ta- asked to be a witness for God, we're asked to share what we have seen, heard, and experienced of God. For some, that will be... Scripture will be a big part of that. For others, it won't be. It'll be more experience. Share what you have seen, heard, and experienced of God because that will move in people's hearts. And the beauty of a congregation, the beauty of all of us together is that your experiences are different from my experiences, which are different from Larry's experiences, which are different from Paul's, and so on. We, as a congregation, can reach countless people that I can't because each of us has a story to share of God. We have something that we have seen, heard, and experienced of him. So Jesus, you know, we know the story. He heals, he teaches, he challenges, he transforms. I'm giving you the movie now. He transforms lives, he laughs, he cries, he exalted, and that's it, two hours and 45 minutes. He is ridiculed, he is killed. No, that was two hours and 45 minutes because we have some time. He rises, spends time with his disciples and others, ascends to heaven where he sits at the right hand of the Father, And you know what? Probably right now in the morning, he's interceding for me. He said, man, I hope Mike gets his right. (laughs) This is important. This is important. (laughs) His story is incredible. So many were just blown away by Jesus. Are we still amazed at him? Is his call so powerful that we can't help but make a radical change in the, core, in the course of our life that we might not otherwise take? Is his life and his teachings vibrant to us? Are they so profound that we can't resist them, that we're drawn into his story? Is it his love which overwhelms us that he would sacrifice himself? No greater love has anyone than that he would sacrifice himself for his brethren. Jesus did that. Are we so blown away by that? Sometimes I know we hear some of the amazing, incredible, miraculous things that happened back then, and we go, well, where are they now? Or, I, you know, I've, I've talked about miracles with some people who go, you know, I, don't, I think like the feeding of the 5,000, which was actually 5,000 men, which was probably more than 10,000 people, I, I think they just started sharing. You know, I don't think Jesus did anything special with the loaves and the fish. I, I, I think it just moved the hearts of the people and more people have food, which there's no evidence at all for. The evidence is that they kept taking it out of the basket and it didn't empty. But miracles, healings, we don't see them in the same way. However, there's a gentleman sitting in the front row over here with a thing down the middle of his chest. How miraculous is it that we can have open heart surgery? Well, that's just humans, is it? Our tendency is to cast aside miracles, explain them away. But when we do that, we empty the life of Jesus of its miraculous power. We should not do that. Let me just say, don't, please don't do that. Please. John, who was one of those first disciples called by Jesus, wrote the gospel. John was clear about it. He said, we declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes. That sounds familiar. What we have looked at and touched with our hands. We have told you what we know. We have witnessed to you. 
We know it's amazing. We know it's incredible. We know it's impossible. Seems unbelievable, but it's true. It's true. It's real. And I'll take the words of John, which testify to Jesus' miracles over the doubts of a modern theological scholar every single day of the week. I trust John. I've been to seminary. I know what we do. We take scripture and we parse it, and then we parse it again, and then we parse it again. And we get our doctorates, and we get our, you know, our notoriety. Let me, let me finish this morning with a story. There was a boy who was raised in a difficult environment. It was so difficult, in fact, that he once thought that he must be the only human being because... And he was being watched by aliens to see how human reacted in different struggles. He was a funny kid and kept to himself a lot. Made up his own games with baseball cards or used rosters from the paper to play games. And he hit rocks in the field playing out the games. You know, batting right-handed for the right-handed hitters and left-handed for the left-handed hitters. Threw touchdown passes to himself in the corner of the yard. Loved it when it was muddy because then he'd catch it and be, come up money, winning championships, made the winning basket in basketball. Those were safe times. But in between those times, he had a new name. It was Stoop, which was short for stupid. Or as an eight-year-old, he cried one time when a ball bounced and hit him in the head and it bit his tongue. And he found himself having that basketball driven off his head until he stopped crying because boys don't cry on the Saturday before Easter. What would happen to this boy? Inconsistent violence interspersed with games. All he knew was that there was something inherently wrong with him. And he grew up knowing that one thing above all else, that he was the cause. Then Jesus showed up, weirdly, through a high school friend in the bleachers at a basketball game. The young man began to learn about Jesus. He'd been raised in the church, but this Jesus was different. And the message was different. But in the end, he couldn't overcome the thought that he was probably even too flawed for him. And as you can probably guess by now, addictions and rough years followed and in, interspersed in those were amazing times of growth with God. And then recovery happened. Recovery from those addictions and lots of people who loved him for who he was. And lots of counseling and psychiatrists along the way. You see, my counselor, my, my first counselor asked me what my life mantra was. And my response was based on how I grew up. It was, people will hurt you if you let them, so don't let them. And that's how I lived. People will hurt you if you let them. Don't let them. And she heard that, and she realized that what I was doing was putting up walls. And she said, I want you to add a word to it. Put some before that. Some people will hurt you if you let them, but don't, so don't let them. And a miracle happened in that because some people won't. Some people will love you because you're who you are. Some people won't love you. That's okay. And that led me on a journey back to Jesus. See, I put away the Norse godlike, some of y'all know this one, right? The lightning bolt, long flowing hair, judgment, keeping score, God that I grew up with. I began to see my life, and I began to see that God had been there, sometimes holding me, sometimes crying with me, sometimes challenging me, but always with me. And I began to remember the dreams and visions that I had had along the way. The vision of the church as it could be. God gave me this vision of the church as each of us is an individual Part, a cell to a body beyond our understanding. And if we ever got together and we went the same direction, the power of such a body 
would transform and change the world. But we have to focus on Christ and on loving all, and that's tough. There was a time I was sick. I used to work in the oil fields, and I was in my 20s, and, you know, the test, I, I had a bleeding issue, and it looked like cancer, and I, I remember this time, and, and I was just overwhelmed by the presence of God and broke down, and I knew in that moment that this circumstance would be okay, you know, that even as broken as I was, that God was, would see me through somehow. Or the time when I walked through the snow at Lake Tahoe. Mom had cancer, suspended from work, bankruptcy looming. And I was listening in the quiet of a mountain, tree-filled area with the snow that had fallen the night before. You ever that hush? You can really listen in that place. And for the first time in my life, I knew that I was okay. All that stuff, you know, being so different, I was okay. Life was going to be life, but I was okay, and I knew that I knew that God was going to see me through whatever came. And there's too many times in my life now that I look and I go, there's God. Too many times on a Sunday morning, anyway, if you want to get out for lunch or dinner, you know. Schools, degrees, calling to ministry that I argued with until I couldn't. And even today, as I prepared for this afternoon's council meeting, I saw what God had done for us financially in the midst of a pandemic. I am astonished at who God is. Your church, our giving is down, and we are, have never been as financially stable in history since I've been here. We had six months to go. <laughs> you know, we were operating off a grant, and we are financially stable. Through a pandemic and a church split looming. That's not me, that's a God who cares about what happens at Arbor Point Church. And if you saw what happened in here last night with the mighty, you know why. This thing called life, this thing we do when we follow Jesus. You know, the movie is called The Greatest Story Ever Told, but the thing is, the story isn't over. You know? It's okay, Anne. Right, Archie? The story isn't over yet. <laughs> it's a continuation. The thing we do when we follow Jesus, we are continuing the greatest story ever told. And I hope that you come along if you're not already. And please, please, please find a way to love and encourage one another. The world as it is does not need more bitterness and hate. There's plenty of that. It's easy to find. Love, encouragement, building people up, telling them about who Jesus is in your life. We need more of that. We need more of that. Do that. I'm curious what might just happen for all of us.